This is Beyond Busy. I'm Graham Alcott. I'm the author of a number of books, including the global bestseller, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. And I'm the founder of Think Productive. We help people to make space for what matters and get more done. And we partner with some of the world's leading companies who share our mission to transform the world of work. Beyond Busy is where I explore the often messy truths and contradictory relationships around topics like work-life balance, happiness and success, and explore with interesting people what makes them tick. In short, this is where we ask the bigger questions about work. My guest today is Sarah Archer. Sarah is a speaking and marketing coach, as well as a playwright and comedy performer. Her podcast, The Speaking Club, helps people to increase their confidence around public speaking. And she's written a couple of books on the subject too. In this episode, we talk about authenticity, overcoming fear, how to measure your success, and much more. This is Sarah Archer. Sarah Archer, welcome to Beyond Busy. Thanks for having me, Graham. Nice to, nice to be here. But um, your, what's really interesting about your background is as well as all the stuff that you do around speaking and you've got books and um, we'll come on to that, but also you're a performer too, right? So stand-up comedy, playwright and, and have taken a couple of shows to the Edinburgh Festival too. What's that like? Because I've been up to Edinburgh a few times as just as a punter and it always looks absolutely exhausting if you're on the performing end of it, but... Yeah, t- tell me more about the Edinburgh Festival and your experience of it. So um, I did my first Edinburgh Fringe in 2011. My, I did a solo comedy show, which was I probably went up too soon. So that was an experience. Um, yeah, it's I, I love doing the Fringe. It's a brilliant experience. It's, it's, I always like to think of it as the longest and shortest month of my life. <laughs> um, although recently we've been up, uh, we just went up this year actually, which was a completely different experience. So Edinburgh is normally, it's vibrant, it's frenetic. There's like 3,000 plus shows for people to choose from. People all over the world, uh, international audiences, and it's it's amazing. This year, and, and I would say that the average audience size for Edinburgh Fringe is about six people because there's so much variety people can choose from. But this year we went up there and it was a completely different experience. I think there were about 300, 400 shows to shoot, choose from. Oh, wow. So our average audience size was 60. Yeah. So, I mean, it was it was thrilling for us because it had been almost two years, you know, not performing live to an audience. And the audience was so you know grateful and yeah it's brilliant experience so it was it was cool but if you can get to the Edinburgh Fringe uh whenever you can it's it's a brilliant uh time and you'll just the comedy the theatre all sorts of stuff going on you'll love it tell me about have you had performances where there were less than the average number of of audience members have you performed shows to like one person and stuff like what happens then I have done a whole hour-long comedy show a preview to one person and I don't know who felt more awkward but um they laughed and we got through it and uh <laughs> unfortunately they 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 knew me so it wasn't a completely okay. you know, cold person but but it was best feeling in the world just doing it to one person but you do you know you learn you still learn from that experience so did you chat afterwards yeah yeah um so it was someone that I'd worked with previously um in my sort of corporate HR role she she was a finance director uh, with a really good sense of humor okay. <laughs> so contrary to what we probably uh so yeah we had a good chat about it and a laugh about it afterwards but yeah it was and then she came up to see uh, I think either a different show or the same show in Edinburgh so and I suppose that's the thing about doing any sort of performance but particularly particularly performing to one person or taking your own show up to Edinburgh there's something very exposing about it and nerve-wracking about it and it feels quite vulnerable tell me how how did you deal with that side of it and um what did you learn along the way about just how to how to deal with putting yourself out there in that kind of way detachment is something that I'm still learning about because I mean and I actually felt more so when you go up to Edinburgh you know you put your you put the show together it's your baby and you get reviews. Um, so one one show, my second solo show, one one audience member walked out 
um, which I might, I was a bit expecting. It was a little bit about the royal family, which could go either way. Um, but the, the hardest experience for me was when I took my first play up in 2015. Yeah. And I, I think the issue is, is around expectations. So um, if you've got to manage your expectations and do it for the love of it, which is what I, you know, truly do it for the love of it. But, you you know, there's these sort of rags to riches stories about Edinburgh and, um, you know, also, you know, the show Fleabag went up to Edinburgh and then, you know, he's obviously had massive success. And um, I would say they only got a three star review when they were when she was in Edinburgh. So but, yeah, it's like if it, it's try so hard not to take it personally when yeah. someone says something about your work, you know, and it wasn't all bad, but any, you know, it's, it's what we always do as human beings. We tend to focus, we ignore all the positives and we just focus on those negatives, you know, and it's it's just, you know, we need to sort of balance that out or, you know, or just detach from it. And, it, and it's not making it mean anything about us, um, which is actually what my first solo comedy show was about in Edinburgh was was about the, the things that we make. You know, something happens, we make it mean something and all of that stuff that happens as a result. So um, but it's it's a journey, you know, and it's still hard to to detach you from the work you do yeah. um and that's why people you know in a, certainly i've seen in the corporate world before getting your identity mixed up with what you do is dangerous because you know it's it's, it's you need we need to keep those two things separate as much as possible let there's a couple of things i want to i want to come back to the success thing in a minute and uh, you know the idea of becoming the next flea bag or being one of the other 2000 shows or whatever that, that doesn't become the next feedback. But just before we talk about that, so that idea of detachment, mm. I mean, for me, like I don't read the positive reviews or the negative reviews of my books. Cause I just don't go on the Amazon page that has the reviews on it. Like I just, I don't want to see it. And like, I, you know, part of that, I just, I just, I kind of know that I have a bit of a thin skin with that sort of stuff. So what can I do? And anybody else listening to this, if you feel, you know, very caught up in your work and the standard of your work and the results of your work being your identity, like what can you do to change that? Well, it's really interesting. So I'm mean, I, I, going to sort of use an example. So when I got, it sounds like it's not related, but it kind of is. So when I got uh, promoted into my HR director role, I... I just wanted it was a, it was a step up. I wanted to do well. I really wanted to impress, you know, show people that I was worthy. And my performance wasn't there. I think because I was overly worried about this. And so they gave me an executive coach, and and the executive coach asked me four questions. And it's based on the work of a lady called Byron Katie, who you may or may not have heard okay. of. Yeah. And uh, and so he said, to, you know, he said, what you know, what's going on with you? And, and I said, well, my, my boss doesn't value me. And uh, he said, so uh, do you know that that's true? And I said, well, it's, yeah, it's true. And I just like reeled off all of this evidence to show that what I, he didn't value what I did. And he said, but do you absolutely know that's true? Like, are you in his head? And I said, well, no, I'm not, no. And he said to me, who would you be? Or sorry, when you have that thought, he doesn't value you. What, how does it make you feel? And I burst into tears. And it, it just, you know, it pressed my hot, hot buttons. And then, and then he, and he said, who would you be without that thought? And, you know, and it was obviously a completely different person. And then he did this thing, which was the turnaround. So looking at that thought in a 360 uh, degree, and we were, you know, obviously came to the conclusion that it wasn't about him valuing me. It was about me valuing myself. And I think this is, this comes, this is probably at the heart of everything that we, we do. And I see external stuff stopping people who want to speak, for instance. And, you know, mm -hmm. and I talk about this all the time. There is nothing that I can teach anyone about speaking or storytelling um, that will stop people judging you. Yeah. That's just yeah. the way of the world. That is what people do. But what we have to realize is that, you know, that's their stuff. It's not our stuff. So we can only control what we control. And if, you know, and we need to work out what's important to us um, and why we're doing what we're doing. And also we recognizing we're not, you know, we don't like everyone and not everyone's going to like us. So 
oh, when I when I you know I'm starting doing my new play uh, first time next year to uh, and uh, Brighton Fringe, and I know you know it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. I mean, it's hard, but it's just recognizing that if you true to your message and true to what you want to do, it will reach the right people, and that's your job to get your message to the right people, and not everyone will like it. And if there are what they call haters, I don't like the word, but the haters out there or the people that will put, pull you down, it's yeah. a, it's about them, it's not about you. And often when we see people doing things that we want to do, it presses our hot buttons and it it's, it's you know it makes us feel like we're falling short and then we lash out. So that's so, so there's a lot of stuff there, but it is all tied up with we need to be you know, being clear about why we're doing something and why it's important. And and we just have to focus on what we we can control. And, you know, I did a podcast on this recently where I talked about, the, you know, the serenity prayer that the, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous use. There are a few lines in that that are relevant to us, you know, what, you know, give me the wisdom to know what I can control and what I can't. And that's, and it's a similar sort of thing, really. So long answer, hopefully it, 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 it sort of caught sort of got to what you wanted to know you know I remember my coach saying to me once when I was um writing my first book and I was you know having a having a sort of self-doubt moment about the potential criticism that the book might get and uh, I remember my coach just said something to, to me like to the effect of don't write don't think about writing the book for the 10 people who are going to hate it think about writing the book for the 100 people who are going to love it and it was such a simple thing to say, but I just hadn't even really thought about the people who might really get use out of it and value out of it. You know, you just sort of don't have that in your head when you're going through those sort of moments of doubt, do you? It's just all about the, um, you know, the sort of the negative consequences that haven't even happened yet, but that are sort of there in your head, you know. And I think if we can come to the point of just accepting, you know, I think, you know, that's... Um going back to Byron Katie, her big book is Loving What Is, and we can accept that people aren't going to like it. Um, and, you know, that, that you're not everyone likes what we do, but that's okay um, because we're doing it for this reason and we're doing it for the people. You know, just the one person who gets the message or, you know, if I can, if through the podcast that I do, if I can get one person speaking that wouldn't help without it or, you know, or just make people sort of shift perspective a little bit, you know, it's really, that's really great. So um, let's talk about your podcast. I'm still going to hold on to that thought about success. We'll come back to it. But so your podcast, The Speaking Club and the work that you do, I mean, it feels like there's there's a huge number of people who um, really despise the idea of having to sell themselves, make an elevator pitch, get up and do a talk. You know, these are things that um, stoke up a lot of fear in a lot of people. So um, I'm assuming that's uh, that's good news for you in terms of it keeps you busy. But um, let's just start with like, where does that fear come from? Like, why why do people really struggle with the idea of of, of getting up and doing a talk? Most of the time, it comes from this thing called the anxiety gap. So a guy called Eckhart Tolle talks about this. So what what happens is that um, there are two types of fear, basically. There are, the, you know, the fight or flight fear when something, when you are in immediate danger, that kicks in. And then there's this other type of fear called imagined fear. And what happens is that we project into the future or we go into the past and something that's happened in the past, we will project into the future or we just imagine in the future, you know, the worst things that can happen. And... And this this gap between where we are in the present and our mind being in the future is this anxiety gap. Mm. And and so it's it, what we need to do is manage our mind around this imagined fear. And there are some tools and techniques that people can use to to manage that. One of the great ones is perspective. I always love you know when I also teach people how to do stand up comedy, and you can imagine how scared people are as it comes closer to the showcase and they're going to be standing yeah. up there. Yeah. And one of the great tools we use is perspective. So, you know, there are other things that you faced in your life that are probably more difficult than getting up on stage and you've conquered those. And then the other thing is putting it, you know, in the big scheme of things when other people are facing life and death situations, doing this is, is, not, is not such a big deal. So that's the first thing. And then the next thing we can do is start to manage our mind. So our imagination is such a powerful tool. And... 
so you know but we can train it to, and, and and if it's used the, if it's our enemy then it, then it can sort of cause anxiety and phobias but if we can train it to be our friend and um, we can use things like visualization so that our imagination is thinking things you know is is sort of recreating the experience in the future positively then that helps us to uh to do things uh, differently and to start managing that anxiety so those i hope that it sort of answers it but yeah there's some things that we can do around that and obviously the last thing is actually do it because when we do something and you know susan jeffers says feel the fear and do it anyway then things often less uh less scary than we thought they were do you think they're similar in the sense of just the more you do them the easier they get so if you're if you're about to do a pitch at work or you're about to get up and do a talk it's like just know that this is a process this is another step on the process of it getting easier you know if you do this one the next one will be easier and so on and so forth yeah i think so i think you've always got to, to prep i think if you can invest and in, so that you know a lot of confidence comes from when we're prepared for things so yeah. um you know i wouldn't ever say that you know just getting up and doing it without preparing it is is great but but nevertheless, you know, that will be a bad experience, likely, but you'll learn from it. And I think if you can see everything, you know, as I, a lot of people say to me, Sarah, I'm not ready to speak, you know, and, and it's probably true. They are not ready to speak in front of 250 people, but they're ready to start on the journey. And I think as long as you're committed to being on the journey to the destination you want to have and, and expecting, you know, there's going to be failures along the way, but what can you learn from that? then you will definitely, the more you do, the better it will get, um, you know, with that caveat of doing some prep and being clear and intentional about what you're doing it for. And that comes back to that why. Because I think a lot of people stumble when they make it about them uh, rather than seeing themselves as the vehicle for getting that message to the people that need to hear yeah. it. And when you take yourself out of the equation, it makes life a lot easier when it comes to doing these type of scary things. And one of the things that you teach people how to do is to craft a good elevator pitch and to think about storytelling. So what what do you think makes a good elevator pitch? I think, first of all, really being clear about your audience's problem and pain, fears and desires. Because I think, you know, we can get too close to the thing that we're working with, uh, you know, whether it's our product or services. But if we can step into our audience's shoes in the first instance and sort of understand where they are and also what what is the job to be done that, you know, well, you know, so when people use me, they want to do a talk to, you know, sell their message, sell their stuff, whatever. But getting into the mind of their audience is the first important thing, being clear about the problem that they solve um is is also really important and people's you know some of the myths and stuff around that problem because i think um and being able to articulate what you do clearly and simply in a way that is going to connect with that person that you want to you know that you want to be your target customer is is really important so you know i was one of the things that i often say though is is open with something that's important to them because no one cares about you best yeah. one in the world yeah. like so what's gonna catch their attention um and that's you know think about a question or a statement or something that's going to make them go wait what 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 was that and 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 don't start with you because as something i always say is um you know don't share about you until they've until you've made them care about you mm. so when yeah. you've said something that catches their attention that is relevant for them then you know then later at the point you know introduce you are uh, who you are because people essentially are, are trying to understand four things you know it's certainly in a buying journey you know, is it relevant for me um can you do the thing that you're saying you can do uh can, is it possible for me to do it and is it possible for me to do it now and those are the sorts of things that you need to be thinking about when, when you're doing your pitch um but yeah so but keep it simple keep it relevant for them and put yourself you know don't make it all about you as ever and and that you know there's some tips there one of our team matthew brown um he used to go to networking events and his opening line would always be how many emails have you got in your inbox and then someone would go oh you know four thousand or whatever and he'd go 
I've got zero. Do you want to talk about that? And that was like, yeah, nice one. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, yeah, it's a really, absolutely. really neat way of getting, of sort of getting into ele- elevator pitch by starting from a pain, a really obvious pain point for so many people. Yeah. And obviously the other thing I didn't say was telling stories because, you know, that's my big thing. It's, you know, people love to hear stories and they'll remember a story much more than the facts and figures that you tell them about, you know, how many people this or that, you know, or whatever features and benefits, if you can tell them the story, they'll remember it. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt the podcast, which you know I don't do very often, and that must mean I've got something very important to share with you. So what I want to share is I've got these two really big events coming up, and I would love you to join me. If you, let's say you are involved in some, in an industry that's quite dull, like your job is to supply radiators or something, right? Um, How do you tell stories with that stuff? Like, how can you, like, what's, what, what are some of the, are there some, some kind of tips and techniques to turn even the most mundane of things into something captivating and, and that feels like it has a real story to it? I always get, and I love this. So my back, background before I went into HR was in IT. So I often get asked, how can I make IT sexy or how can I make this sexy? And there are t- two tools uh, which are kind of under the same umbrella, but metaphor and analogy um, link to this audience intimacy thing. So people have a problem to be solved. Let's say, let's take radiators. So without radiators, you know, people are going to be cold, they're going to be, you know, if, if you're cold, then you're grumpy. You, you know, there's all sorts, there's all sorts of things that happen if people are, you know, are cold. Um, and what happens when people are warm? They, so you can sort of start talking, start thinking around that sort of angle. You know, what would happen if your house was permanently, you know, cold or, you know, that sort of thing. But also using metaphors and analogies. So finding a metaphor for what a radiator brings to people so you're not actually talking about radiators you're talking about you know things that you know making an analogy between what a radiator is like and and what that means to people so when they you know something else that makes them feel warm and fuzzy um like a radiator Mm. so it it coming back to sort of people's the pain the sort of what if you didn't have this um or you know what would life be like you know, there's also about fuel efficiency and all sorts of things. So, you know, having a new radiator would save you money. What could you do with that? You know, there's all sorts of ways to make it sexy, thinking about what would happen without, what would happen with, and then finding something else. Um, like I, I did a presentation once at work, and we were bringing in a new HR system, and that's not very sexy. But we, when we were, I was putting the presentation together, I talked about the old system being like a Trabant car. <laughs> which is a really, if people don't know right. what a bank car is, really bad car. So that would be the picture of that system. And then like a nice Ferrari or something for okay. the new system. Yeah. So yeah. you're starting to sort of seed in people's minds that sort of uh, metaphor. So there's a few ways there. But yeah, it's definitely easy once you start thinking about what it means to that person. And what's, again, back to the pain you're solving for them. You know, when we talk about radiators there, and the, one of the metaphors I was just drawn to was, do you remember ready wreck porridge oh they, yeah I remember they, with the their red advert blue. used to be central heating for kids and it had like a the kid has his warm porridge and then he's going to school like all warm and stuff and you just think as a parent i mean how powerful is that that you're sending your kid off you know warm in school for the day and fueled and i mean that's just such a powerful um metaphor that you 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 know the central heating is there because you've had that porridge right absolutely yeah, I just there's you know anything can be made to be relevant and interesting and engaging. You just just need to start thinking about what matters to them and looking around for examples and stories in your life or metaphors that would work with that thing to make it more sticky and engaging. And do you follow a particular framework? So obviously it's like the the, the Joseph Campbell hero's journey 
sort of storytelling technique comes up a lot like are there others that you follow or things that you particularly like around that in terms of just helping people to craft it and structure it i definitely use that so to construct particularly people's origin stories so the why behind what they do um a variation on on that hero's journey uh is really good and obviously there's a, another version of it where you you are the company and you are the the mentor to the to the person that you're working with so definitely use that um i also use um and i think this is the this is a big thing actually just in terms of people understanding why this is so important is that and certainly when it comes to sort of change in organizations and stuff that i've seen in the past is that people stories are so powerful because we need to buy into something emotionally first and so often people mis- make the mistake, first of all, in crafting their content or stories or whatever. Um, and secondly, in selling it in doing that at a logical level. So when we sit down to create a talk or create content, quite often we're writing uh, from our neocortex, which is the newest part of our brain. But we're missing the fact that everything that we, every bit of communication we take in goes through our sort of primitive uh, reptile brain first. So we have to get the attention of the reptile brain if we want anything to go up to the neocortex of the other person, which is why stories are so powerful or attention grabbers like questions like what, how many emails have you got in your inbox? It's like, oh, okay, that's something different rather than I'm Sarah Archer and I teach people how to blah, 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 or whatever. Second thing is, is that, yeah, we have this emotional experience before we buy in logically and when you start to talk to people at a logical level first, you start to use the sort of techno babble stuff, which is a uh, is the number one you know reason people fail when they're selling an idea or message. So we've got to tell the story of how we discovered that thing, and and then you know try and people will vicariously experience it through your eyes, and hopefully if you do a good good enough job and structure it in the right way, they'll buy in emotionally and get on the same page, then you can talk about the logical stuff. So it's, and stories, that's why they're so powerful. So it's like the story gets you into the heart and then someone's already bought in and then they just need the evidence through the logic to to make a good decision. But if you start with a lot of stats or evidence, then people are just kind of a bit lost, right? Yeah. And so that's called an epiphany bridge because you need, you know, there are, you, know, you need to get people to believe what you believe and, and you can't do it through logic. It has to be getting them to sort of get, have that emotional buy-in. And that's, you know, that's exactly why stories work. So, so I use that in, in, in teaching people how to structure their talk and, and also to proactively use stories to break down beliefs that people have that you know they can have this aha moment like oh my god that would be amazing i can really i can buy into that and then they have these doubts like oh but it, you know they won't work for me because of this or that so proactively understanding what's the story behind that belief they have and then telling a story to trump that so that's something we we work on as well that's interesting so the, there's obviously the story that you that you that you kind of broadcast out but there's also understanding the story that's going on in someone else's head as their reason for not buying in or their reason for rejecting your idea or or whatever um do you have any particular ways of you know is that just about understanding your customer like how you know how to figure out what those stories might be yeah and i mean the first thing i do with you know, people that I work with is we start at the at the audience level and we say, you know, what are the myths, the mistakes, the beliefs that people have around the thing that you are sharing about? Um, and then their own, you know, what are the possible limiting beliefs they have about their ability to do that? And then, and then normally there are three categories of sort of objections, which are one is, you know, you have stuff that's related to the vehicle that you're talking about. So, you know, for instance, it could be, you know, speaking or YouTube or change management or consultants, whatever it happens to be. And then there are uh, sort of objections about their ability to do what they can, you know, their internal beliefs. And then there's the external beliefs, which are often time and money. You know, we haven't got time for this. We haven't got the, can't afford mm-hmm. it. 
So yeah. you have to proactively address those um, and you can do it in a talk. You know, you can take people around the whole sort of customer journey in a talk or, you know, in your content or communications, if it's an internal corporate change, you know, you need to be sitting there thinking what might come up for these people, what might get in the way of them buying into this and, and start putting out content or have stuff ready to think about, you know, to trump a story that might be behind that belief. So, um, you know, and, you know, one of the things you, you might relate to is a lot of people think that in order to be successful, they have to work hard. And so one of the things that you could talk to people, you know, a thought reversal sort of thing around that would be, well, how many people do you know that work hard that aren't successful? Mm. So it's not true. Once you can start to shift people and shake those sort of beliefs a little bit and then tell a story that sort of knocks it out of the way, then they're going to be much more open to whatever it is you're talking about, whether it's a new idea, change, product, service, whatever. And that saves you so much time. If you can get the buy-in up front, you know, I've seen so many projects fail because they didn't do that human part at the start. And it was all about project management methodologies and stuff. And if you don't do that part, if you don't capture the hearts, you're wasting your time. So yeah, it's really important. That's really powerful. And that's a lot of that stuff is stuff that I just feel like I don't do or don't think about and you know maybe occasionally I'll do that stuff almost accidentally but it's not I've never really thought about it in that sort of systematic way before that's really interesting yeah it's it is making I think this is the thing when for me I, I don't like to think of myself as a speaking coach because I think that's only half the equation like you know it's about what you say and being intentional and strategic about the content as well as the delivery and it really is a, a sort of those two things together so you know that's that's what's really important for me the, the two things working well together so a couple of other things i wanted to talk to you about before we finish so you did a ted talk which talked about authenticity <laughs> yeah. and it feels like we have been through a really interesting time over the last couple of years with obviously being on zoom seeing into people's houses recognizing that people have a life beyond work there's definitely been I think a, a sort of humanizing of, of work over the last couple of years. So t talk to us about that. And also why, why did you think authenticity was a, an important topic for you to talk about? For me personally, the idea behind that, that talk or the issue for me behind that talk was that um, I, I have a daughter. Uh, when I was in my corporate job, I was working around the clock. And I think it goes back further than this. So I've always felt that then I need to be doing the next thing, that I'm not doing enough, that I, that I, you know, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? And so I'm often, and still, you know, even having done that talk, I, I know this is something that I need to work on. I'm not present often, you know, so I'm, you know, away with the fairies thinking about whatever it is I'm thinking about. Mm. And so often I miss some of the big moments, particularly in my daughter's life, where I don't feel I was present enough. And so that talk was like how the original thing was like, how can I be more authentic? But what I realized through that journey was that it being present and trying your best all the time to be in the moment um, is the most powerful way to be authentic because once you're in your head or you're wearing these masks and, you know, there's back to these sort of roles that we play and you know, people often have a, an idea of what a presenter should be. And I really, the whole point of my podcast is you, you are you, and that's the best version you need to be bringing to the stage. But, you know, this idea of authenticity is just stripping away and being in the moment, you know, back to Eckhart Tolle, he talks about this idea of the pain body, we are in pain most often when we are in the future or the past. That's when mm. our ego is, you know, is most the most noise in our mind is when we're thinking about the future and the past. When we're in the present or when we're in flow, doing stuff that we're passionate about, that voice is so quiet. And and so I think it, it's all about connecting to the moment and to the other people that we're with. And I still struggle. 
Um, but it's so important. And again, as a speaker, connecting to your audience, being in the moment, not thinking about the slides or everything else, trusting yourself and letting go at that point is so important. So that's, you know, it's a struggle being authentic. For me, that's what it is, is being present. And it's hard. And being present is a, a real skill and also something that people really value, right? So I've, I've noticed when I do talks, let's say someone's phone goes off or just something clashes and bangs in the corner of the room or just something like that. You don't even have to be that funny, but it, as long as you just acknowledge that that has just happened in the moment, then everyone just goes, oh, and just like, relaxes and really and really feels good about that acknowledgement of the present. And it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be rocket science but i think people just really value that that sense of this is this is the present moment we're you know we're all experiencing something together and it's and it's the same and it's and it's a shared experience almost yeah that that's one of the first things i learned when i was uh, learning to do comedy if you're a co- if you, you know, they say if you're a comic on stage and something happens and you don't acknowledge that mm. you will lose the audience yeah because they're completely distracted by that thing and you need to own the stage and bring them back to you. So, and, and you're right. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have even have to be funny, but there's a relief that people feel that you've acknowledged that and, and you can sort of make it like, Oh, we can all move on now. That's, that's yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. just move on. Even if it's a bad thing, you know, so uh, exactly right. It's that, and it builds community as well. That's at the same point, you know, we are all in this together. So that's a really good point. Glenn. So your own struggle with trying to be more present. Yes. That's still a, a struggle that's ongoing, but what have you learned that helped? Reminding myself, I think time is a big thing on this. So I, I, this is, sounds pretty really sort of out there, but I think I've got quite, this sounds really bad, but it's the, what I'm being honest here. So I think part of it is that I, I know I'm mortal. I know time's running out and I feel like always I need to be doing something. So, but the one thing that I've learned is I think when I get, when I get to the end of my life and I look back and the regrets that I have at that point will not necessarily be about, you know, the things that I have or haven't done in relation to work is probably going to be in relation to, to people and spending more time with the people that I love. And so I, if I catch, if I can catch myself and say, like, I need, this person's important to me. I need to be present. And, and it's bringing it back to the other people and the people, you know, what's important to me. And we can get so caught up on the treadmill of life and significance and, legacy and all of that stuff but you know the things that we'll look back on will be the moments that we've lost you know looking at the sea or being you know i know it sounds twee or thing but that's you know that's how i have to bring myself back because you know i'm often in my head thinking about the next thing i just it's not that important in the big scheme of things yeah and you've mentioned that two or three times the idea of the next thing the next thing and the idea of being busy and Obviously, this podcast is called Beyond yeah. Busy. <laughs> I suppose I have to ask, what would happen if there wasn't a next thing? If there wasn't a next thing, if I didn't have any plans or... Yeah, I'm just trying uh, to explore the addiction to busy and uh, that compulsion to, to seek out busy in the next thing. I think it comes from making the most of my time. I probably goes back to also wanting to prove that you know, all of this stuff probably comes back to the idea of self-worth in a sense, like proving that I'm worthy. Um, I guess it's a, a human flaw. Maybe it's more prevalent in me. If there wasn't anything, I could relax probably. <laughs> like, oh, I could probably take a breath and the pressure would be off. And I don't know who's putting the pressure on, but mm, it would be yeah. it would be freeing to have that, you know, n- nothing to think about next. Um, yeah, freeing and uh, peaceful, I guess. Let's come back to what we were talking about near the beginning around um, flea bag at the Edinburgh Festival. And <laughs> yeah. It feels like when there's a big runaway when, runaway success like that, then everyone else is taking their show up, thinking I could be the next flea bag. That could be me. So when you're going up to Edinburgh, is that is that on your mind, or is it just I love the process of of this? Or if you're honest, is there, is there a little bit of you which is like I'd love to be that next flea bag kind of thing. 
absolutely, I mean, I'd be a liar if I, if I said that I wouldn't want, you know, my, my dream is to have one of my plays on the West End, mm. you know, and ideally be in it and direct it too. You know, that's not, I've got mass vegan. <laughs> that, that's, you know, but I can't do it for that because I, if that's the, you know, I've got to do it for the love of it. Yeah. And I think, you know, I love what I love about what I do with people who are teaching them speaking and what I do with writing a play and, and, and bringing it to life is, is seeing something created um, and seeing, you know, people fulfill their potential on the speaking side of things and get their message out there, but seeing, bringing something to life and seeing it created. And that's, I mean, that, that's got to be enough, but I'd be a liar if I didn't, you know, if I said I didn't want, you know, to have a, a sort of fantastic hit that everyone's talking about, you know, that would be cool. But, you know, I think that, that, that you know, b- being attached to that is dangerous, I think. So does that give you a perspective on success? If I, if I was to say, how do you define success? How do you, how do you measure success with, um, with the work that you do? I think if I can get to the point where I'm content that I've done the best that I could, that, you know, and my intention is there to, to do good with it, to make a positive difference with it, that would be that would be success you know once I, when i was a hr manager early on there was a guy and i we we brought him in to talk to him about something and he was just so happy and content with coming in and doing his factory job and going home and i just was so envious <laughs> like it i just thought how cool would that be to be content so i think for me that's happiness would be being content that you know i'd done the best and you know that, that that was what I, I hadn't sort of had given it all, and that was the best that I could do. I think that's got to be it. So, and it's maybe touched someone or made a little difference to someone. I want to know more about the the guy doing the factory job. So, did you ever talk to him about why he was so happy and content? No, I didn't. But I could just—he just radiated it. He just like, you know, he didn't. It's not that he didn't have ambition, but just he just was happy you know he just he had his family he had a job you know he he planned to be in that place for a long time his dad worked there Mm. and there was just this sort of glow of you know I'm happy where I am sort of thing and you know so I wish I had sort of followed up I guess but um yeah that's what I got from him you know he, he was quite happy and he just you know enjoyed his work enjoyed when it you know he didn't take anything home he just sort of when the yeah. when the when he when he finished he went home and he spent time with his family and focused on his family and that's you know that was i was envious of that because that wasn't something i did i took work home even even if i wasn't physically working on something i was mentally thinking about something and i think that's that's a really big thing for all of us who either run businesses or have a certain amount of of sort of autonomy and self-direction in our work and for people working in businesses with managers and employees and teams and and you know, and a, a sort of a, a, a sort of um web of different connections around that too where in all of those scenarios it feels like in a way we never switch off because even if you even if you don't have to be answering emails at 11 o'clock at night you're probably still thinking about the email that you're going to answer the next day or um you know the the sort of the next issue that's coming up on the horizon i remember um i dated someone for a while who was a chef one of the really interesting things i learned from that was the compartmentalization of work so you know she would go to the restaurant she'd do her shift but then when she finished and came back she'd be so she'd just be so present you know, and she just and she wouldn't have to worry about work until the next time she was arriving, you know, at her office sort of thing. And I and that really struck me as something that we haven't solved. Those of us who are, you know, working in offices or working with information or working with people, you know, whether there, there just always is that that next thing to think about and the, the next thing to do. Yeah, exactly. And that, I think that's that's yeah, it's, it is. It's hard. And I. But I think you've got to start, comp- and I think a lot of people are focusing on this now in terms of teaching people tools to be able to compartmentalise better. 
there are so, you know the boundaries between life and work are blurring even more with with more homeworking, which I think is a good thing. Um, but then it's about you know teaching people how to draw the line and also creating a culture in which people feel able to draw the line. You know, one of the student, my students at the moment is a, is a resilience teacher and she was in, in the construction industry and she she had burnout. You know, she recognises it now. She didn't recognise it then. But as a leader in an organisation, what you do is far more important than what you say. And there's a lot of organisations that are out there saying all the right things, but not necessarily doing the right things. And so setting those you know, rules about what we you know about emails after a certain time or at the weekend and and actually sort of role modeling that um, will enable people to compartmentalize those things better. And if you are a business owner and you know, I'm a, I work for myself, I'm my own company, I think it's recognizing that your business should be designed around the life you want. And you are in charge. You know, you choose what you do when you do it. And people will recognize if you set boundaries um, and respect those. So I think, you know, they're big things people should, you know, we need to enable that more through the culture of an organization and through recognizing ourselves that what are we doing this for? That feels like a really good place to leave it. But I've got to ask you a bonus question, um, which is um, uh, I heard you in your talk say that you came out to your mum in the cafe of Ikea. Yes, I did, yeah. So I, yeah. I, I just want to know what that was like because it just sounded like a really funny story. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I made the mistake of doing that. Uh, she was, uh, <laughs> she was, we both had Swedish meatballs. I'm a vegan now, but at that point we were eating <laughs> Swedish meatballs. I have to say my mum's been on a journey with the whole, um, you know, as I, it's I'm. I can understand the poor, poor woman. She had a daughter that was married to a solicitor with a daughter. Perfect sort of boast. You know, you can boast about that to your friends and then through, realized, you know, I was gay and, and everything else. And it kind of threw that all into the flame. So she's had a hard journey with it. But when I told her, you know, the first thing she said was, you know, which one of you is the man? And, uh, and, and, and I nearly choked on my meatball, um, <laughs> when, you know, when she, so it's, you know, bless her. She's fine now. And, and my, my, my partner and I just got married in September and my mum did a best, you know, a sort of mother of the bride speech. And, and she, I mean, it's been a long time, but she's got, you know, bless her. but it was, uh, it wasn't the best choice. Don't, don't tell people, don't tell your parents things like that when, when you're both eating and uh, yeah, it's probably not the best thing to do. So it's a very memorable location. Um, so um, just before you finish then, so if people want to find out more about what you do and and also buy your book, um, yeah, tell, tell people where they can connect with you and uh, what you want to share. So you can find out all about me at saraharcher.co.uk. So Sarah with an H, Archer as in bow and arrow. Um, and there's stuff there. And also the Speaking Club uh, podcast is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, all good podcast apps and uh, it was just we're just doing our 200th episode so uh, there's a lot of stuff there that you might find interesting or useful if you are looking to do speaking or use stories more in your content or communications amazing and i'll um i'll catch your next show at brighton fringe next year oh, i look forward to it it's called crunch so yeah <laughs> it'll be yeah it'll be uh it's gonna be good i'll see you there thanks so much for being on beyond busy thank you for having me graham thank you this video is sponsored by Think Productive, home of the Productivity Ninja. We help people and organizations to increase their impact and make space for what matters through a range of workshops, programs, and coaching. Head to thinkproductive.com to find out more. Are you interested in booking me as a speaker for your event? You wanna sign up for my Rev Up for the Week email? Do you wanna buy some of my books? Or do you just wanna find out what I'm doing right now? It's all at grahamalcott.com forward slash links. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share so we can make more. Thanks for watching.